today I'm going to show you how to create a super long time lapse of up to 100 meters. Time lapse photography has become very popular over the past few years because it enables you to create super high quality video with very cheap gear. It's a technique that lets you play with time and show changes in the world that are not visible to the naked eye. You can also play with motion and add a perspective to your shot and move the camera in the environment, playing with foreground, background, and also to create a depth in your images. However, most of these motion control systems are limited to the length of your slider. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to create a time lapse of up to 100 meters in length. For this time lapse, I wanted to find a location where I could make the camera fly over a river or a waterfall, as this is something I've never seen in a time lapse before. Usually, when I try finding a location, I use Google Maps and Google Earth. In Google Maps, you can use Street View for exploring urban areas, while Google Earth lets you see the sun's movement in a 3D environment and see pictures others have taken on the location. For this particular shot, I knew of a river close to my apartment in central Oslo. After exploring satellite images, I walked along the river to find the perfect spot. Over this small waterfall, I found a place I liked, which had trees on both ends which I could attach my gear to. Once on location, I like to use the app PhotoPills on my smartphone to see details about sunrise and sunsets, the movements of the sun and moon, and so forth. To create this long tracking move, I'm using the Surf Slingshot, as it provides everything I need in a compact and portable package, enabling me to get into even remote locations. As the sun was not going to be particularly visible in the shot, the weather was not as important as it usually can be when shooting time lapses. However, I wanted to avoid the light to change during the shoot, such as the sun shining and suddenly being blocked by clouds, so constant grey weather was perfect. I'm attaching the gear to two trees on each side of the river and connecting the ropes between them. Then you set up the carriage and attach the motors. For 3-axis motion control, I'm using the Genie and two Genie Minis, which are attached together using the pan and tilt bracket to provide smooth track pan tilt time lapses. For this shot, I'm using the Sony A7R2, my standard time lapse camera, but most DSLRs or mirrorless cameras will do the job just fine. I've attached a nice wide angle lens on here, the Sony 16 to 35 mm f4. This will enable me to include as much of the waterfall as possible in the image. For this view, I wanted to create a feeling of flying over the river, and I want to pan the camera to always have the river as the main subject in the image. The river will create the leading lines into the center of the image. I also like to use the rule of thirds, so I'll keep the river in the bottom two thirds of the frame and the trees above in the upper thirds. Depth will often give your time-lapse interest, and I think the long movement will add just that. There's not a set way to compose your image, but guidelines like these might make your image more appealing. The Genie Mini enables to use the Serp Genie app, which is essential when setting up time-lapses in hard-to-reach locations. To set my start frame composition, I will turn on my camera and control the camera's position through the app. Once connected to my Genie Mini, I will adjust the pan and tilt axis separately to attain my composition. Now I need to set my camera's exposure. In situations like this, I always want to set my camera in manual as this way I can ensure the settings stay the same throughout the duration of the time lapse. The most important setting in this case will be the shutter speed because of the moving water in the river. I want to keep the shutter speed at about one second or more to smooth it out. Here you can see the difference between a short exposure and a long one. If you have a fast moving object in your time lapse, always try to keep the shutter long for smoother results. In order to achieve such long shutter speed during daytime, you will need an ND filter. I have a variable one from SERP, which I will use to make less light hit the lens. I like to keep my aperture at around f8 in order to make the image as sharp as possible and to make both the foreground and background in focus. 
Try to make a good balance where the sky is not too bright and the shadows are not too dark. If the dynamic range in the scene is too big, I like to underexpose a bit to avoid clipping in the highlights. I find it easier to recover darker areas in post. Adjust the ISO accordingly, but try to keep it as low as possible to avoid noise. Make sure your lens is in manual focus and that you're shooting in RAW if possible. Now that I have set up my composition and exposure, I'm going to set up my movement parameters. The length of the cable that runs between the two end bars has markings every meter to help determine the distance. In the Genie app, first I'm going to set my tracking direction and distance. In my case, the distance is 24 meters. I need to set the tracking distance to the length of my slingshot. However, I will leave one meter as a safety buffer, giving me a total distance of 23 meters. I can then set my pan and tilt parameters. I want the river to stay in the center, so I'll add a counterclockwise rotation of about 100 degrees. I also want the camera to tilt slightly up in order to reveal more of the river behind the waterfall as the camera moves towards it. Once I've set moving parameters, I can set the timing parameters. There are three values, record time, play time, and interval. Record time defines how long it will take to record the time lapse. Play time is how long the compile time lapse will be and the interval is the time between each photograph. In this case, I will use the play time and interval. I want my final clip to be about 24-25 seconds, as I don't want my movement to be too fast. When setting your interval time, there are a few things to consider. The first thing we allow for is the move shoot delay. This is the time from when the motor stops moving to when the shutter fires. In the Genie, this is set to a default 400 milliseconds, but I usually like to set this around 1 second to allow the camera to settle for longer before taking the next photo. This is important for cable setups like the slingshot, because there are usually more movement in the carriage caused from the motor compared to a slider setup where 400 milliseconds will be sufficient. So the move shoot delay takes up 1 second of my interval time. The next parameter to look at is the shutter time, which I've already set to one second. And the last factor we need to consider is the time it takes to process the image onto the card. If shooting raw, then one second is usually enough for this process. So in total, we have three seconds we need to account for that includes move shoot delay, shutter speed, and card processing time. As a safety buffer, we'll set the interval to five seconds, which should give us plenty of time for all these things to happen. I'm now all set to begin the time lapse. I can simply press record on my phone and leave it to capture. Alright, so my time lapse is finished and I am back here on my computer. I've imported all my photos into Lightroom. I'm not gonna stay in Lightroom for very long. I'm gonna jump over to another program, which is LR Time Lapse. LR Time Lapse is a great uh, application if you're doing time lapse. There's not really a way around using it if you're doing high quality time lapses. It has a trial version, so you should definitely check that out and buy it if you like it. So basically what you do is you find your time lapse here on your disk and you just click on the folder and it will automatically load all the images and it will create a preview for you here and you can play it back and you can get a real time preview of your raw files and you can see how your time lapse turn out. So this time lapse looks fairly dark because this graph is far down on the image. I'm probably gonna make it a bit brighter, but not that much. You can see that the image gets brighter here when you have more of the river in the frame. And then it kind of drops a little bit in exposure here. So I'm gonna try to fix that. 
So how we do it is to set keyframes and there are a few ways to do that. One way is to click the keyframe wizard and you can see that it creates keyframes here with a set distance. I'm gonna do it manually for this one. So I'll have a keyframe on the first frame and then a little bit out here when things are changing and then when we're approaching the waterfall, maybe around here and here. And you can see the exposure is getting a bit brighter right here. So I'm gonna set where it's the last frame of being dark, which is about here. And then the first frame of it being really bright, which is like here. And then I'm gonna set at the last frame of when it's really bright, which is around here. We can see it changes, it gets less bright. And then the first frame of it being really dark which is here and i'm probably gonna stop my time lapse about here so i'm gonna put a keyframe there and that's what i have to do right now i click save and then i head back into lightroom and i select all images command a and right click metadata and read metadata from files so lightroom and lr time lapse works hand in hand and what you do is you do one thing in one of the programs, then you save the metadata, and then you import that data back into the other program, and that way you work back and forth. This data is just a file with text that explains what the user has done with the image, and it also contains information about the image, like shutter speed and ISO and all that. So that's the file you're importing back and forth. You don't have to really think too much about that file. You just save and read the metadata. So now all my data from LR timelapse is applied into Lightroom. You can see that LR timelapse has marked the keyframed images with a four star rating. So in order to sort out all those images that was keyframed by me, I click on attribute and I go to the star panel here and I choose just one or two or even four. So here you see all those images that back in uh, LR timelapse here, put a keyframe on. So now I will start to edit only these photos and then I will save it back and continue to work in LR timelapse. So I have the first image selected and click on the develop module. So the first thing I see is that the white balance on my image is off because sometimes LR timelapse applies a white balance to my shots, which I don't know why they do it, but the original white balance was uh, here. So I'll just set that properly. I like to use presets when I edit my photos so that I do not have to individually edit every single sequence as I like it and also to kind of keep a continuous look across images. So what I have is some Visco presets, which I downloaded way, way back, uh, which is just a bunch of presets with different kind of film looks. And the one I usually always use is the Coda Gold 100 minus minus, which gives a very nice I think, look to the image. I think that's it. I'm not gonna do too much to this image in terms of coloring. I think it looks pretty good as it is. You can see the leaves here has a pretty good, nice yellow color and you'll see more of those leaves over here. So I'm just gonna keep it as it is. This preset, if you're wondering what it's doing, it's just doing a whole bunch of things in here to kind of simulate a film look. So now that I'm satisfied with this image, I'm gonna copy the settings and just check everything. And then I'm going to head over to my next image where I'm going to paste the settings I just copied. Uh, you can also click Command C, Command V. What I'm trying to do now is just to match up the different images to look as similar as possible. And what I like to do is just jump back and forth between those two images. And for me, it looks like the first image is a little bit brighter than the second. So. I'm gonna just increase this exposure by uh, just a tiny bit like this. So when I'm done with this image, I'm gonna just copy again and paste. And again, I think this image looks a little bit darker than the previous one. So I'm gonna increase it to something like this, maybe even a little bit more. I think that's all right. 
copy again and paste over here. I'm just gonna decrease a little bit and then do the same again. As you see this time lapse, there's not a whole bunch to do. In many time lapses, you have to do really drastic changes. So these two looks okay. It looks a little bit brighter here. So I'm just gonna go down to one. Yeah, that looks good. And I think now we're coming to the point where there were a little increase in exposure when things got a bit brighter. So here you see already that the waterfall here getting brighter. So I'm going to decrease this a little bit more. All right, so that's how I want it. Then I continue to the next one. Again, it's getting a bit brighter, so 0.5. So as you can see, I just go back and forth and kind of check the images over and over again to make sure they are similar exposure. And then I copy, paste, and you can change all the things here. You can change highlights, shadows, and not only the exposure. So here you see there's a massive drop in the exposure. So I'm gonna raise that again. All right, so it looks like I hit straight on uh, there. Copy, paste again. And that's a bit dark. And All right, so that looks good. It's maybe a bit too bright. Okay, that's all right. And then this is the last frame, which I'm not gonna use in my final video, but I'm just gonna add it anyway. Okay, so that looks good. So now all these 10 images are uh, edited. So now I'm just gonna mark all of them again and right click metadata. And this time I'm going to save the data to the files. So the opposite way as last time. And then I'm going to head back into LR time lapse and click reload. And as you can see here, this is the brightness that I've created in Lightroom. And you will see that I did a bit of increase uh, and then more and more of an increase. And then I got to the brighter areas and I kind of lowered the exposure a bit and then I increased them back again. And you can see that this is kind of mirroring this graph. Ideally, you would want your graph to be as flat as possible. So once I click reload, I'm going over here to auto transition, which means that LR time maps will create a smooth transition between these keyframes and make a gradual increase or decrease in exposure between all the keyframes. So as you see here, you see a smooth graph now. Uh, and click save again. And now in this time lapse, there is no flickering. It's very, very smooth, but you're not always that lucky. If you have flickering, you should go and click on visual uh, deflicker and that will make your time lapse a lot, lot smoother. Go back into Lightroom, but now I'm not gonna edit these images. I'm going to go back and apply the changes LR time lapse made to all the images. So I'm going to click Command A to mark all the images. I'm going to right click and read the files again. Okay, so now all the metadata files have been updated. And like you can see, if I click on the first one or the second one, you can see that the files are updating with the new adjustment. All I have to do now is to export all these images. You click Command A again to keep them all uh, selected. And then you go and export. And create a slingshot. JPEGs and I like to have a custom text with the numbers so you'll have a nice and neat uh, sequence. I like to keep them in JPEG. I want to keep the images for the maximum resolution for as long as possible so I'm not going to resize. You notice I'm not cropping or anything. I like to do that in my final edit. So when you have all the text put in you just click export. So now all of my JPEG images have been exported like you can see here. Now you can take some different path. You could go into After Effects or you could go into any other video editor. But I'm gonna go into Premiere, which is my editor for time lapse. So I'm gonna double click here and import the JPEG sequence. Uh, make sure to check image sequence and click on the first shot and it will automatically appear as a video file in Premiere. 
So the thing I want to do is to basically stabilize the footage a little bit because it's pretty stable but a little stabilization would make it even smoother. What I'm going to do is drop the images here to create a sequence. And then I'm going to go into effects and you could search for warp stabilizer and apply that and it will take a little while especially with this sequence because it's so huge 42 megapixels so it will take a little while so now my stabilization is finally done and my clip should be ready to go the clip is still in the full resolution so i want to scale it down to what i want my final output to be so i'll create a new sequence and for this one i will go with a 4k image which is 3840 by 2160. Just click OK and I'll drag the clip onto the timeline here. Remember to drag the sequence because this has the stabilization applied. And keep existing settings. And as you see, the image is now uh, very zoomed in because the resolution is much higher than 4K. Actually, this clip is over 8K in size. So I will scale it down to fit so about there, and then I'll move it a little bit up to get the right composition. So I think that's about where I want it to be. Maybe a little bit down so I get a little bit more of this waterfall uh, visible. So what I could do now is just add more time-lapse clip onto here because usually you're not having a time-lapse clip on your own. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it with one clip and with no music. I'll go ahead and export uh, the sequence. This is something that many people are wondering about, what should I export as? If I were to upload it directly to the internet, I would probably go and do H.264 and I will do a two pass. And since this is 4K, I would go up to maybe 60 megabit per second to get a decent quality. And then I will click export. I'm now going to show you the final clip and I hope you like it and I hope you like the tutorial. Thank you for watching.